Okay. All righty. Um, so direction that we want to take this in, how are you feeling today? Do you want to just be in flow? Do you want to tell me what you want to or not want to talk about? Well, I think, I think that the way, I mean, both, you know, be in flow, but I, I think a, a general tack that, that, that I'm feeling pretty excited about right now is just kind of the ways in which we men are set up to fail in relationships. Mm. Um, you know, that's, that's the, that's the subject of my book. It's uh, just what I'm excited about. It's um, something I have a lot to say about. And you've been in relationship for a long time. We both are in relationships. You know, I think uh, you know, a lot of the men coming into your ecosphere are in relationships. They're certainly fathers. Yeah. And, um, you know, many of them are going to be husbands also. So I don't know. That, that, that kind of lights me up. But we can be in flow about, it, you know, how we navigate through that. How's that yeah. sound to you? Yeah, perfect. Yeah. I like it. All right, are you ready? I'm ready. Hey, man. It's going to be great. Let's dance. Let's dance. We're gonna this dance is going to be really us. great. I enjoyed our, I listened to, by the way, our chat. Um, and uh, I think most of it, I think I got through most of it. It was just fun. It was just fun yeah. listening to us rant. <laughs> yeah. All right, here we go. A little pause. Uh, and by the way, I'm saying it right. Brian Reeves. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Brian him. Reeves, welcome to the Front Row Dads podcast, man. Hey, man. Uh, uh, thank you, John. I'm glad to be here. I was you. You were you were you were just asking me if you were saying my name right, Brian Reeves, which is a funny question. But the truth is, I've lived a lot of different places, and my name is spoken in many different ways in those different places. So, what's the most interesting pronunciation of your name? Uh, Br Brion. <laughs> Brion. 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 I lived, I lived in France. <laughs> Reeves. I lived in France for a year and a half. And so uh, Brian, or that was my, I was actually married to a French woman. She would yeah. call me Brian. Sounds kind of lovely, but man, it was, uh, it was not a good marriage. And so I did not hear that my name used in with affection often. I, you know, I remember being in the South of France and having somebody explain to me that, that they just don't use an R. So, you know, everything's real. <laughs> you know, it's like, no, real. Wheel. We, Wheel. I, yeah. 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 Um, Brian, let's talk about uh let's talk about life today. Um, for once in your life, be honest, would you? I'll I'll, <laughs> I'll do my best, man. Vulnerability <laughs> is uh a work in progress. <laughs> uh a little history for those listening, man. We we became fast friends. It didn't take long for us to right. Yeah, find meaningful conversation. I think that both you and I felt that was um, exactly how it should be when we're yeah. when we're finding our tribe. Yeah, man. And so uh, I look forward to more of that today and just talking about whatever does come up. But you know, I, I want to tell also a quick story about a connection that we have from the past, which is that you wrote an article that changed mm. one of my friends' lives in a significant way. That article led to a book. Um, you've done lots of interesting things in your life. There's no question about that. Um, but in this season of life, mm. you seem to be providing a space mm. and ideas, putting words to feelings for men that they're very interested in, you know, being in dialogue around. So first of all, that's a, that's a props. And that's Thank a thanks you. to you for the work that you've done. I also know that you're in it. You're doing the work yourself. It's not like you wrote the book and now you just get a chance <laughs> to kick back with a drink and just yeah. reap the benefit of the reward of all your years of hard yeah. work. But yet you're you're in the fire still because you are doing life. 100%. Yeah. That's right. I, I what's alive it? for I you love... right now, man? What's like literally this morning as we record this, what's alive for you? You know, I uh, I just had a conversation with a man who uh, just an hour ago, who is joining my Elevate Your Relationship program. And this is specifically for men, <clears throat> this program, this experience. And, and this, is, this is a man who's a lawyer, successful, built his own law firm. Uh, he's raising three kids that are uh, late teens. So, uh, and he's probably, I didn't, I don't, I'm not sure his age, but he's probably mid forties ish, married. Uh, to a to a woman who also was a lawyer, <clears throat> and um, you know what I'm just so struck by 
you know, he shared, and I'm not betraying any confidences here because this is something that, that all, we all men go through. I go through it regularly with my wife, but he, he simply shared a, a, a moment of missed connection with his wife that happened uh, I think yesterday. And, you know, you said, uh, you know, I, I, yeah, I wrote this book, choose her every day or leave her. I, 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 I have lived, I think a very, I'm very grateful for the life I've lived. I'm 48. You know, I've, I've, I've seen some things as they might say, <laughs> and I've had my ass handed to me by women in particular, like intimate relationship, I would say, like I have always chosen women who would not let me get away with anything. <laughs> We're not very skillful in the ways they wouldn't let me get away with stuff, right? But, but you know, at 48, being seven years into marriage with my wife, you know, yeah, not sitting on some, like you say, some mountaintop, just meditating with no demand on my life, no problems, no challenges, just fucking in it. Um, you know, this, these tiny little missed connections that we men in particular are constantly missing with our partners. Um, I think this is so alive for me right now because what what I'm just so struck by is how how we men are just set up to fail in relationships. What do you mean by that? We're just, we're just set up to fail, meaning meaning most of us are are doing what I call the wing it method of relationship, just winging it. Right? We're either doing what our parents did or we are doing something in reaction to what our parents did. But we are not, we're not set up to succeed. We don't have any idea what our partners mean when they say, I don't feel connected to you mm. or I want to feel connected to you. Like we don't, like this man I was speaking to this morning, you know, good heart, very smart man. He's a fucking lawyer. He's, he's smart, intelligent, went to a you know, great university, very educated. And I can relate to all this, you know, I had a master's degree in human fucking relations. It was an HFR, human fucking relations. It was my <laughs> master, master's in HFR from the University of Oklahoma. I got that in my mid twenties when I was in the military, you know, very educated. I had three sisters, two moms, and yet, oh man, I just fucked up every relationship I was ever in. Mm. And I always went in with good intentions. I don't know, John, have you ever met a guy that went into a relationship thinking, I can't wait to fuck up this woman's life? Uh, it's not, <laughs> it's not something I've heard a lot. <laughs> yeah, I've not heard it ever. Now, I've maybe... heard it after people were in relationships. But... <laughs> right. Right. Well, retaliation is one of the strategies we tend to, uh, to go to when we stop, when we realize yeah. I'm not getting my needs met. Yeah. You know, we may not be consciously aware that we're not getting our needs met because a lot of us men don't even think we should have needs, right? So we, that's one of the ways in which we're set up to fail. We're, we're, we're taught not to have needs as men. Maybe we can have desires and even those we got to be careful about, but definitely needs, a man has needs, nah, don't be needy, right? But then we're in relationship and we don't get our fucking needs met. And, you know, yeah, retaliation is one of the strategies that we then uh, uh, re resort to. And so it does become a kind of, you know, hurt people, hurt people kind of thing. For sure. What, with all your men's work that you've done, and, you know, throwing into the pot there your own personal experience, what is the most common need not met for men? <sighs> That's a great question. Well, let, let's talk about the things that I think men are most afraid of in relationships. Um, you know, Terry, Terry Real said, said this beautifully. He said, I, I don't, you know, there's this, there's this cliche, this idea that men are afraid of intimacy. And he says, I don't think men are afraid of intimacy. I think men are afraid of being overwhelmed, of being, being dominated, being subjugated by relationships. Right. I think, you know, I, I call it, um, the masculine objection, which is, you know, David data taught me that, that, that f the masculine value is freedom, which makes sense. Um, 
so the, by extension, the masculine objection is, you know, don't take away my freedom. Don't control me. Don't tell me what to do. And I think that obviously isn't universal for every man. And, and a lot of women will also be a stand for that. Don't tell me what to do. You know, my wife doesn't want me to control her, but she doesn't have the same fear of being overwhelmed or consumed by intimacy as I do. And so I think, I think one of the, the greatest needs that, that men don't get met is, is the feeling of I'm free. I get to be my own man. We have a deep, deep need to be our own person, to be, to, to feel our own freedom, have our own agency. And I think what, what gets robbed from men and you know, it's relationships are a co-conspiracy. I'm not blaming women for this. I mean, they're as ill prepared for relationship as we are. Uh, well, that I'm not sure that's entirely true, but they certainly aren't prepared with skills and skillful communication. And, um, and so I think what happens in relationship is whether spoken explicitly or implicitly, I, as a man, don't have the freedom I deeply need to be myself. And so I think a lot of men do end up feeling suffocated, overwhelmed, confused, burdened by the demands of their partner or the relationship. They don't even understand really what the demands are. How does a man know the level of freedom that he wants? How does a man have the awareness and the courage to, you know, acknowledge what he needs, to say what he needs, to communicate, and then to yeah. live that out week in and week out? Well, I, I'm a stand for all, all adults have absolute freedom, right? But, you know, I, I titled my book, Choose Her Every Day or Leave Her. So I'm freely choosing my wife. I don't have to stay in my marriage. I, I, don't, I don't buy into the have to mentality, certainly not when it comes to relationship. I don't, I don't believe in relationship as obligation, I, I espouse relationship as invitation. You know, when I'm, when I'm working with couples or I don't work with women individually so much anymore, but, but when I do work with women, let's say in a, in a, a relationship context, one of the, the things that I often am helping them to make that, 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 that switch is to stop showing up or stops communicating in ways that suggest obligation like you have to do this or else and start being a, a strong invitation for her partner to show up to meet me, not because he has to, but because this is how I, as a woman want to do relationship. And, you know, you don't have to meet me here in this way, but you know, and yes, there will be consequences, but I'm not going to punish you or right? getting rid of the punishment aspect of things. I, I think, you know, I think that's the thing that, that, that a lot of us men, you know, I, my friend, uh, my friend Tate, who actually co-leads this relationship program with me, uh, he had a he had a real uh, awakening um, through some therapy he was doing years ago, and he realized he he got this message in his childhood from his parents: always tell us the truth, and we won't be able to handle it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? What a fucking message! Always tell us the truth, and we won't be able to handle it. Right. Well, what do you learn as a child? Well, it, it, that then. You know, I don't know about your experience, John, but, but my experience with, with women then in my teens, 20s, 30s was the same. Like they, they, they said they wanted the truth, but fuck, it sure seemed like they couldn't handle it when I offered it to them. Right? So, you know, what did I learn from that? It's not safe to be who I am. It's not safe to tell the, the, the truths of my heart. Yeah. On that note, when it comes to, let's tie a couple words here together, right? This freedom of expression, feeling safe to share what's on our heart. How much freedom should we feel entitled to expressing ourselves in our relationship? Yeah. And I've wrestled with this too, of like, how much do I feel that I should be able to say just to get off my chest? How much do I want to yeah. say to grow the relationship? How much do I want to say so that you understand me better? Yeah. And, and how much of that is dumping and how much of that is like communication where is the bounds that you have found, the boundaries of yeah. communicating with transparency, yeah. freedom of speech in your relationship? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, uh, the first book I wrote uh, is called uh, Tell the Truth, Let the Peace 
fall where it may. Mm -hmm. Tell the truth, let the peace, P-E-A-C-E, fall where it may. Uh, in that book, I point out that I don't believe in radical honesty. I don't think that that serves radical honesty. My wife actually dated a guy who was doing radical honesty, reading Brad Blanton's book, Radical Honesty, and was a pr practitioner of that. And quite frankly, she was so grossed out by this guy. Because <laughs> Good he, morning, sweetheart. I don't like your face today. <laughs> you stink, you know? Uh, but it, it, it was worse than that. I mean, a, a woman, they'd be sitting out at a cafe and a woman would walk by and he would feel an urge and he would grunt like a sexual, oh, God, I, want, I just want to fuck her. Right in front of, you know, my, my, my wife, who wasn't my wife at the time, but like, how does that serve? What is that? And I think, I do think that, look, all of us men on some level, because of that, that, I think that core masculine value of freedom, all of us want on some level to be able to just be our gross id selves in, in, in public, in front of the world, just because it feels good. I don't have to be guarded. I don't, all the, all the, I can just relax and uh, express and be loved. I mean, I think that's the other part of it. I want to be able to sure. express everything and be loved and be okay and be accepted and feel like I still belong. And the problem with that is that it's a complete affront to my partner's sensitivities to the kind of experience my partner wants to have. And when we're in relationship, we have to take these things into account. You know, I'm with my wife seven years. You've been with Tatiana how long? 16. 16 years. I mean, we don't get to stay the same person we were when we were single that we become in relationship. We just don't get to be, we don't get to stay the same. That's a big myth. I think a lot of people go into a relationship thinking like, you know, I just get to be exactly who I am. I don't have to change. And this person should love me no matter what. And I think when, when we really start to do intimacy with somebody, um, and by the way, you know, I want to say real relationship, a number of, of the teachers that I've studied over the years have said this in different ways. But uh, I first heard Clarissa Pinkola Estes say this in, in her book, Women Who Roam With The Wolves, paraphrasing, but real relationship begins the day we get over the fantasy of relationship, mm -hmm. right? The fantasy, the, the dream I had of what this was going to be like. When I, when I wake up to disillusionment, like, oh shit, this ain't going to be the fantasy. That's the day real relationship begins. And part of that real relationship is, is the exploration of, okay, you know, who is this woman I'm with? Who, who, what are her sensitivities? What are her boundaries? What are the things that if I say this, it's going to trigger that reaction in her, or it's going to violate that boundary of hers or you know, one of the things that that's been very eye opening for me, and I, I do work a lot with masculine and feminine intimacy, because I find it's, it's just a map, you know, and I always remind people don't confuse the map with the terrain. Right, it's just a map like a topographical map. It's, it's not the terrain, it's just a map. But one of the things that that this opened up for me and particularly in communication to really address your question. You know, my wife, she's more core feminine than I am, which, which to me, that means her, she values connection pri predominantly and primarily, whereas I tend to value freedom first. You know, in fact, I, I call myself the, the, the freedom fighter of our relationship <laughs> and she's the, I call her the feelings fighter. She's fighting for feelings because that's where we feel connected in the feelings, in the feels. Mm -hmm. Well, so if the masculine objection is don't tell me what to do, don't control me. Well, the feminine objection, if the feminine values connection, the feminine objection is don't abandon me in this. Don't leave right. me alone in this. And that was really eye opening for me because what I, what I discovered is that my wife is hearing everything I say and do through the filter of like through this question, what does this mean for our connection? That's not what I'm hearing things through. I'm hearing things through the other filter of what does this mean for my freedom? 
right? And in, in all my previous relationships, John, I didn't get that distinction. And it was a shit show because I wanted to be able to just say freely whatever I needed to say, but all my partners were hearing threats to their, to our connection. And I, I might've just been philosophizing about something. You know, I, I have this fun question that I've been wrestling with uh, Sylvie, my wife, and I've, I've posed it to some of my guys. Uh, it's really, it's, it's really telling. It's really interesting. I said, babe, what if we, what if we were together for a thousand years? 1,000 years. <laughs> Do you think at any point in those thousand years, you might want to, you know, explore other <laughs> partners for just, just six months? <laughs> I mean, like, babe, like year 700. Do you think there's any possibility you might even be open? <laughs> you know, what's funny about that is she looks at me like I have three heads. Yeah. You know, she looks at me like, no, this is just more time we get to be together. And I'm, I'm again, I'm arguing for freedom. I have no fucking idea what would happen at year 700, John. But the, but my brain is like, well, just the, the freedom to think possi possibilities equals freedom. Yeah. Like maybe, like you would just be open possibly in year, maybe, how about year 900? You know, we've been together 900 fucking <laughs> years. You don't want to take, take, take two days. Take... <laughs> and she's so like, great. no. We're for, together forever. But that's so illuminating. Like, I don't get to... In this examples, in, do our bodies age? <laughs> do we look the same? <laughs> we're looking for the loopholes. Exactly. <laughs> for freedom. Because loopholes equals freedom. <laughs> she doesn't need any loopholes. In fact, that's let's courage. shut down all the loopholes. Just yeah. the answer is no. Yeah. We're connected for a thousand years. In the past, I would have been angry or disturbed by that or confused. I would have literally taken that to the point of, oh, my God, this woman doesn't value freedom. I wouldn't have used those words exactly, but that's how it would have occurred to me. And I would have been really concerned that we're not compatible. Yeah. I, like in my 20s and 30s, I literally would have thought we're not we don't have the same values. That's bullshit. Well, it's actually kind of true, but it's also bullshit. You know, it's just that she is a stand for connection primarily and predominantly first and i'm more of a stand for freedom and all the ways that that looks but you know and 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 herein we dance when you wrote the article that went crazy viral led to the yeah. book right was that article titled choose her every day it was yeah choose her okay. every day or leave her yeah do you think that's why men gravitate towards it even from the title because in baked in that is choice of choosing her every day I think that's a big part of it. I think the other part of it is challenge. We yeah. men do want to be challenged. You know, choose her because you have to. Well, that's a shitty title. You know, where's the challenge? I have to. Uh, you just now I'm not. Now I'm in victim now. I just I I have no agency. So yes, I think part of it is the freedom to choose. I get wow. I get to choose this, and if I don't choose her, I can leave her. I think they're, I think you're a hundred percent right. And again, I think we, we men do need to be challenged. It's why we don't tend to marry the easy woman. You, you know, think that we're more of a yes, because we have us. a no. Say that again. Do you think we're more of a yes, because we have the option of a no? Like is, is the, it's such a, is the, you know, or leave her, is that such an important part of the equation? Because if you know you can leave, you're more in. Is that possible? Or it kind of flies in the face of the burn the boats mentality yeah. of like, cut off all options. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a great question. And I, I think it's, a, I think relationship done well is a paradox. You know, my, my brain gives me outs all the time because it's it's for all kinds of reasons but you know and i think i think most most men if we're really honest with ourselves uh we have our moments of fantasizing escaping the relationship you know like no brian except for you john except for you <laughs> everybody except for me like like every man you give him that that question we're together a thousand years is there you know what happens at year 700 do you do this you know do you maybe explore most men would say, yeah, at least be open to the possibility. Um, and, and I'm also very clear that, look, I've burned the fucking boats. Like I am all in on my wife. I'm all in on this relationship, I should say. 
And I, th I think, again, it's a paradox. I mean, if, if, you know, my wife and I've talked about this, like what would happen if in 10 years or 20 years, there was some experience that happened that just broke us or, you know, it's like we, life is messy. Relationships are messy. You know, I choose her every day or leave her was, was, I, I wrote it from the, from looking back at a relationship in which I didn't choose my partner every day for five years, I stayed with her, but didn't choose her. And, and I, and I didn't choose her in the sense that I was wishy-washy about the relationship. I was, you know, I was, I was in, but then I would leave and then I would come back and, and, um, talk about threatening her experience of connection. I did that constantly, but I needed to feel my freedom and she didn't know how to help me do that. I didn't know how to help her feel connected. So it was just a shit show. Mm. So, you know, that title was born of a, of a, of a reflection into the past. Mm. Um, but it informs my relationship with my wife because every day I wake up and I make conscious effort. To choose her and in all kinds of way, part for whatever reason, I will be the one to reach out to her in the morning to, to initiate relationship, for example, you know, I'm, 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 I'm leaning into my own edge every day to make sure that this woman knows I am choosing her mm. not, and not reluctantly, not hesitantly, not because I have to, but because it's the fucking choice that I make. I want to, I want to come, I want to pause for a quick sec, Bri. I want to check our internet, um, team yeah, will make a, make a laggy quick edit right here at 34 minutes. Um, but let me just make sure let's close. Maybe we close windows. I feel like we had this problem before, didn't we? I don't remember, but yeah, I'm definitely you, you were, you were starting to get cut out and it was getting a little choppier as we were yeah, going. So something. just, I do think something's going on on my side here. Give me a sec. What's going on? Oh man, I've been just, my computer is just, I'm surprised you're still there. I lost the window. Brian, how, how does your girl know that you're choosing her every day? If she were here representing her point of view, what would that look or feel like? Well, first off, she would, she would acknowledge that intimacy is not easy for me. You know, she would acknowledge that that connection happens differently for me than it happens for her. You know, there there's a gap that we do live with her and I, and I think this is common in a lot of couples. There 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 is an intimacy gap. There's a connection gap. I think every couple, most couples deal with this, even if not all the time, some of the time. And I think I think the best couples just know how to have touch points throughout the day or week that close that gap at least right, for let's, a moment. let's talk about what is an intimacy gap let's define that so you know one of the one of the one of the the examples i like to use is you know for for a lot of men particularly if uh if nobody's bleeding if the house ain't on fire if you know we have enough money to pay the bills and feed ourselves we're fine i feel connected right we're good whereas you know, if I'm married, you know, in my case, my wife, that doesn't mean she's fine. Mm -hmm. You know, we can have all those so-called problems solved. And if she doesn't feel connected to me, well, she doesn't feel connected to me. And I think this is a big challenge. Again, this is one of the intimacy gaps. Men think that there has to be a reason to not feel connected you know, a betrayal or I don't know, an argument or something just fucking went wrong and we're pissed. Men think there tend to think there has to be a reason. Whereas it's like, and I know I'm speaking in broad sort of gender-ish 
uh, tones here. Obviously, it doesn't apply across the board. Some women will identify far more with, with what I'm suggesting men go through. But I think, again, men tend to need a reason. Women just need the moment. They just need a feeling. And that's a huge gap because, you know, I, I could get frustrated that my wife doesn't feel connected or she's asking for something or wanting something. And I don't understand why she's wanting this thing. She wants to spend more time or she wants to just sit on the couch and look in my eyes. And you know, every night we go to bed, um, my wife wants to keep the light on and keep talking and connecting and looking at me and me looking at her and again, doing intimacy, you know, what, what Terry real calls nose to nose. I'm kind of done with the day. I'm ready to turn off the lights, go to sleep. I'm tired. I had a full day. You know, babe, we had a nice conversation at dinner. Why, why do we need to connect now? Like we're fine, right? <laughs> like that's, a, that's an intimacy gap. Mm. But when we start to realize that these gaps are not, they're not signs that something's wrong with the relationship or you're not compatible. They're just evidence of two people who connect differently, who experience connection differently. Okay. Well, that gives us an opportunity to start creating practices that close that intimacy gap. I'll give you an example. One thing my wife and I do every day is um, we hug intentionally in the morning. We connect body to body through a hug. And that what that looks Good like strategy, is- strategy, Brian. Naked with coconut oil? <laughs> uh, only on Sundays. Okay, good. <laughs> that doesn't really work when I've, when I've been at the office already for a couple hours. And, you know, I tend to-, I tend to uh, I wake up earlier than she does and, and, and I get, get at my work and we, we both work at home. So, you know, if I'm not on a call, if I'm not in an in a meeting, when she's up, I will go and we will hug. I will stop what I'm doing and we will mm. hug for just five seconds. It's not a long thing, but it signals to both of our nervous systems. I'm with you, right? Mm. I choose you. I love you. You're special. You're special enough for me to stop whatever I'm doing and connect with you, right? It takes five, 10 seconds, but how many of us miss these moments, these, these, especially these, you know, these, what we, what we call transition points, you know, getting up in the morning, leaving for work, coming home from work, uh, getting ready to go to bed. Like these are all transitions that we men again, tend to, just overlook like it's it's not a big fucking deal you see one of the ways that we men have been set up to fail is we we we've been taught that outcome is more important than relationship right just give me the outcome i want you know let me be productive in certain ways to get the outcome that is wanted doesn't matter how i or anyone else feels about it right well again that just totally fucks us when it comes to then being in relationship with someone not that outcome isn't important outcomes are important but we make them we tend to make them all or nothing we tend to make the outcome of absolute importance and all the relationships around us must serve that outcome or be sacrificed mm -hmm. you know remember in the mission impossible movies <clears throat> there was a I don't remember. I only saw a couple of them, but but one of them that I saw, um, this was part of the plot. You know, Tom Cruise, his character, I think is Ethan Hawke. He had been married, but as it turns out, he couldn't stay married to this woman because if he stayed married, John, he can't save the world. Too many people will die. So he, this is in the plot. They speak to this in the fucking plot. Tom Cruise has to, and of course we can all identify with that. Yeah, like like 3 billion people are gonna die if Tom Cruise stays married. So what does he do? He doesn't stay married. He experiences intimacy as fantasy rather than reality. And that's what we men are taught. Right. We're, we're, we're taught to, uh, again, I love Terry Real. He says, um, we, we idealize in principle what we devalue in fact. So we idealize intimacy, you know, all our pop songs and movies that, 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 that show us the, they tend to show us the longing for intimacy. But I mean, how many movies and pop songs are there out there about long-term healthy marriages and just right. enjoying that? Um, not many, 
right? So again, it's baked into our culture, man, that, that, that outcome is more noble. I mean, imagine Tom Cruise chooses to be married and 3 billion people die. What fucking kind of movie is that? Not the ones we want to see. Right. So again, man, it's just cooked into our programming that, that being relational gets in the way of a good outcome. Here's a question about outcomes and relationships. How do we ask for what we want Mm. without blaming the other person? Yeah. Like if I say, Hey, I would like more sex. That's like blaming that person for not providing in the way that I want. It's like, Hey, you're falling short here just by the sheer fact that I'm asking for more. Hey, whatever it is that I want, it could be something to do with, Hey, can you make more money? Can you be nicer to the kids? Can you talk this way to me? Could you cook healthier food? Could you let me speak? Could you like, whatever it is, it just pokes at the person of something there where they're falling short when we ask for something that's not currently in the relationship. Well, to answer it quickly, and then I'll expand a little bit more. Um, I, I'm, I believe that leading with reassurance and acknowledgement is the only way to go reassurance and acknowledgement. In other words, it might look like, you know, I love making love to you. You're beautiful and sexy. And I love the way that you are with your body. I <clears throat> love everything about you. And, and also vulnerability, right? Rather than you need to give me something or I want something from you. I, I like to talk about well, what's the impact of what I'm actually experiencing. And, you know, we're not making love very much and it hurts me. You know, I'm feeling lonely. I'm feeling I'm starving. I'm hungry. I'm, I'm missing your body. So I'm in, I'm in my impact. I'm sharing the impact of what we're experiencing not blaming her. You know, you don't have sex with me enough. You need to have sex with me. I'm not pointing the finger at what she needs to do. I'm being vulnerable about the impact that I'm experiencing, but I'm also being honor, reassuring and acknowledging. And and I know, I know you're busy. I know that you've been under so much stress lately. I know that you're carrying a lot. I mean, we got the kids, you're working, you're, you haven't been feeling well. And I know that you're going through a lot and I know that it's hard for you to, to want to make love at the, at the frequency that I'm asking for. I totally understand all that. And I'm not saying you have to do it the way I want to do it. I, I just want to, right? So now I'm partnering with her. You don't have to notice. I'm also shifting from obligation to invitation. You don't have to do it the way I'm saying, but we do need to find another way because I'm really hurting over here. I'm really struggling and I, and how, how can we figure this out together? Right. So I'm, 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 I think imposing solutions on our partners never works. I want to, you know, I, even, even I need, I want you to stop talking to me in this way, even that, right. Probably the thing that I'm wanting her to stop doing is the thing I'm right now doing, giving direction. I like to make a distinction between criticism and feedback. Criticism is simply direction given that isn't being asked for. Say that again. Criticism is direction given that isn't being asked for. Mm -hmm. That's criticism. Feedback, on the other hand, is a vulnerable revealing of my experience of what's happening for me. You know, it's like, it's the difference between you need to stop talking to me. You need to stop yelling at me. That's, that's criticism. Who knows what she needs to do, but that's, that's criticism. Not likely to go over well. Feedback is, you know, when, when you talk like that, I get really angry. I feel really, I feel, I feel, I fucking start to burn inside. That's feedback doesn't mean that that's necessarily going to be an easy conversation to still have, but at least now I'm sharing the impact of what's going on for me. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm setting the table to make powerful requests, but I'm not, I'm not becoming the very thing, the, the finger pointing bossy or, or checked out dismissive, just, just, just not present, uh, you know, person that I'm probably in that moment maybe anyway, at least in the frame we're talking about thinking that she is. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'm also wondering what level personal responsibility plays in here. When you talk about 
like leading with reassurance and acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. I love that. You're, I even think like, I've just had this whole body reaction. I'm like, yes, the language, like just you saying, th say this, men, <laughs> yeah. men talk this way. Right? Yeah. It's like, it's just so good to have that language. I can't tell you how many times I've had a guest on the show or I've heard in our community, somebody use words that then I just immediately was able to pull out and yeah. use because they just gave me structure yeah. of those words where I heard it and I'm like, yes, that's what I've been looking for. Yeah. So another one is, is level of responsibility. In those, you know, hey, I want to acknowledge you. I want to reassure you. Do we also say, look, this is my piece of this. This is my ownership. I, I don't believe in 50-50 relationships. Mm -hmm. I, I believe in 100-100 relationships. Both people have 100% responsibility for the success or failure of the relationship. That's the, the foundation I tend to stand on in, in my work. And so what, what, what I mean by that is, yeah, hundred percent. I have a massive role to play. I may not always be able to see it and I probably often can't see it. And oftentimes my partner, when she's pointing the finger, whether skillfully or otherwise, she's probably pointing at something that's going on sure. in my hundred percent. Sure. Right. So I think, I think, again, I think, I think healthy relationships, healthily, you know, where people are really communicating skillfully they're able to, to both to call out what each other is doing in ways that are non-offensive and still loving and reassuring. You know, I'm, I'm able to, if my wife, for example, is maybe crossing a boundary, one of the boundaries that, that I have in my relationship, and I, I suggest all men stand for this boundary and women too, is don't assume you know what I'm thinking or feeling. You know, I've, 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 I didn't realize that that boundary is being violated my entire life by women coming over and assuming they know what's going on for me in my inner world. Right. It's incredibly disorienting. And I would usually just get defensive and angry yeah. because I, it's, they're, they're making big assumptions about what I'm feeling, what I'm thinking, and I don't like it. Because and that's the biggest form of disconnection because they don't know you. Right. They don't, well, and, but I didn't know how to let them know me either. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So a lot of it is they're also just filling in the blanks that I'm not filling in for them. Right. Don't because take responsibility for this, Brian. I think this is on them. <laughs> <laughs> Let's float that out there and see how it goes over. Um, women, it's your fault. That's right. Um, I, now you know, we know the title of this, this episode. It's women's fault. Yeah. <laughs> women are to blame. But see, that's what's interesting. See, but this is another way we men are set up to fail. We are taught that women are the burden. You know, women are the fucking burden. If they would just do it the way we think they should do it, everything would be fine. We're, right. we're so let, let me ask you a question on this real, too, real quick, too, because I saw the other day, it was something on social, something funny where you might have seen this. Other people probably saw this. It's uh. Hey, if you want to love a woman, all you have to do is, you know, date her, tell her she's awesome, send her flowers, be interested in her feelings. Do it was like a list of 50 uh, things. If you really want a woman's win a woman's <laughs> heart, here's what you have to do. And then uh, the other part is if you want to win a man's heart, you just show up naked, bring food. And then, you know, and, and here's the thing. I think what it does is it paints a picture on both sides that's probably inaccurate, right? Yeah. Of and, and some people might go, John, shut the hell up. That totally nails it. Um, mm -hmm. And I understand how you might feel that way. And there's, there's of course, some truth to all things that are funny, right? But, but uh, what I hear is like, women are complicated, impossible to please, mm -hmm. right? Nothing you'll ever do is going to work. You'll be yeah. on a quest forever. And men are so simple. So mm -hmm. all they want is food and sex. I don't think that's true either. No. So I, I think that as a society, we have, you know, I'm going back to what you said earlier now a couple of times about being set up for failure. Yep. How much of the memes and the marketing behind men and women is part of what's setting us up? The repeated messaging, yeah. right? Like that one that yeah. we just hear and whether or not we consciously subscribe to it, we're, it's programming. Hundred percent, man. I mean, I grew up in an era where marriage was just made fun of. 
you know, married with what was that? What was that show with Ted the Bundy's? Married with children? Is that married, married with children? With... Married with kids? Married with children? I don't married even remember the name. Yeah. And and look, Bundy, Al Bundy, that was his name, right? Al Bundy. Yep. Yep. He was a fucking joke of a husband. Yeah. And yeah. what was his wife? But this, you know, sort of, you know, big, big, big titted, uh, sexually horny, but for him, such a turn off. He was so turned off by her and he made fun of her all the time. I mean, marriage was a joke. Yeah. Marriage was a joke. It was made fun of. We men understood that, you know, bachelor parties were like the, the, the last day of freedom that you ever get to have because after here, you know, you're kind of fucked and not in the ways you want to be once you get married. So, I mean, that's the message. Of yeah. course, women tended to get the other message that, you know, marriage is the best day of your life. Like now you finally, you know, and notice, here's what's interesting. Those two values, right? On Mary Day, on the wedding day, the woman gets the ultimate prize of, of absolute secure connection. She got it. She won. But the man loses. He loses his freedom. That's the frame, right? He's, he's done for and she's finally made it. That's the kind of core cultural message. And yeah, we're both, we're both screwed by that. There's so much wrong with that. There's so much wrong with that. I mean, my wife, and I think a lot of women experience this, there was also a mourning period for my wife when we got married. She also was transitioning from a, a, a chapter of her life that was beautiful for her into now being you know, part of her identity is now wife to, to Brian Reeves. Right. You no know, wife and, and family person. And there was a huge transition for her in that, that she had to mourn and grieve as well. And I think a lot of women, this never gets talked about because of the cultural messages. And the, and again, this frame that, that men have largely set up that all women want is, you know, secure the bond connection. All men want is, is sex, which I also believe is just such horseshit. It's such bullshit. Um, and it's so damaging, you know, and that whole, you know, just show up, naked with food that lasts for most guys for about a weekend yeah it's great at first but then and this is again man another way we have been set up to fail we do crave intimacy we do fucking crave intimacy we do want a woman's heart beneath just the you know the tits and the pussy on her body yeah we want those too but that becomes pretty boring pretty fast if there's nothing else going on for most guys i think i mean some guys maybe maybe not i can't speak for every guy obviously but we men do crave intimacy but we've been taught that we don't we've been taught all i want is sex okay well i guess that's all i should want it's bullshit and then naturally in the face of a woman that wants intimacy Man, it's just a shit show for us. I have great empathy for men. You know, I really do. Men, men, I know men are getting beat up in the world these days. And, you know, <clears throat> 10 years ago, I'd be, I was beating up men also because I was so angry at my fathers and, and, and just the men in the culture. I was just so angry at men. But the more I've done men's work and the more I've worked with couples and working with men intimately, man, I have such compassion in empathy for what we go through and for for what we're carrying and for and for how sensitive we actually are right we are sensitive beings man it's just that we've got a lot of armor over our sensitivity because we've been taught again that'll get us killed that'll yeah. get us made fun of exploited you know dominated by other men cast aside women won't respect us or love us. i mean it's just sure. you know our our buddy john wineland writes about that in, in um in his book about sensitivity and how we've are as a society we've defined that as a weakness but when you think about like a highly sensitive person like a hunter that's attuned yeah. to the environment and sensitive to the environment they know how to hunt more effectively um sensitivity i was taught as a kid was was probably not a good thing you're highly sensitive which means you're not tough right you're right uh, so and i love this reframing or this new understanding um of of attunement you know being so dialed in that you know what your wife needs what your kids need what your business needs that sensitivity i, I want to learn about 
Um, and, yeah. and I think to, to piggyback on that, I think that's really important. I think, again, another thing men tend to be afraid of is if, is if I'm too sensitive to, let's say, my, my wife or my partner's experience, I may do things I don't want to do. You know, if I'm really listening, if I'm really attuned, she's then going to make demands that I, I may not want to fulfill upon. What then? I'm fucked. I'm lost. I'm, I don't get to be, again, here we go. I'm robbed of my own agency. I don't get to be my own person. And so I think a lot of men shut down sensitivity even further because of the fear that, yeah, if I really feel her, I'm going to be drawn into something that I don't want to be drawn into. So better to numb out, check out, focus elsewhere. But I don't think that's how, a, well, I know that that's not how it has to be or, or what a healthy relationship looks like. You know, me being attuned to my wife is vitally important for her happiness, for my happiness. Me doing what my wife wants me to do is not. You know, me just blanket doing everything she insists that she needs me to do, that never gonna fucking work. You know, I, I, that's just gonna cause resentment and, and ultimately she won't even respect me. You know, that's the proverbial man who, who's, who's surrendered his balls to his wife. None of us wanna be that, we all know that that's not a healthy model of marriage. But therein is the dance, you know, how can I be attuned to my wife, be sensitive to my wife and still be my own man? That what a beautiful inquiry to, to live inside. I mean, that's the dance. It's not a it's not a place I arrived at five years ago. And now, you know, I just am something. No, it's a, it's a question every day that I live. I mean, you know, we've we've had this come up and you know, different scenarios where I really want to do something and she's really scared of me doing it for whatever reasons, usually having to do with connection. Well, when I, as I've learned to be reassuring, to speak to her of the connection, to reassure her that, you know, our connection is solid, it's, you know, and, 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 you know, that creates space. It's, it's, it, it, it allows me, it, it, what it does is it helps her relax into, into my freedom. Ironically, you know, what I, what I often am helping couples figure out is, is, is again, I'm, we're speaking in you know, pretty binary terms here, but just, just painting broad strokes, you know, uh, to help people make sense of some things. But in a, in a heterosexual context, when, the more masculine oriented person, the one who's more freedom oriented, uses connection language with their partner. See, usually what I do is I try to, I try to use freedom language and out because I'm trying to set my partner free. I'm trying to give her freedom. She doesn't fucking want that. She wants connection. In fact, when she feels connected, then she feels more free mm. and she can tolerate my freedom. And same, you know, oftentimes she's, her tendency is to want to use connection language with me. But I remember one time she said, um, oh, this is a whole rabbit hole. I won't go down this, but I remember that years ago we got into a fight and at the end of it, um, she told me, you know, I, I want you to know, I really care about your feelings. And my first thought was, why? I don't even care about my feelings. <laughs> like, why does that matter? Mm. But what she was doing was using connection language. It wasn't helpful. Didn't fucking mean anything to me at the time. I mean, it, it means something more to me now. But at the time, I was like, I don't give a shit if you care about my feelings. She's using connection language. It wasn't landing. But when she uses freedom language, which is like, I'm not trying to control you. I'm not trying to tell you what to do. Right? Those words help me. In fact, those words, when she uses freedom language with me, I feel more connected to her, right? So we're, we're, we learn to use each other's language. We actually create the beautiful dance of, of intimacy that, that, you know, it's like the yin yang symbol. It's like the, the yin and the yang moving into each other, dancing, moving, flowing. When we can speak in each other's language, um, the dance works far more harmoniously in my experience. Brian, I'm looking at the clock. I know you've got a call coming up. I want yeah. to honor that. So to, to wrap this up, I want to give you a chance to not summarize our interview today, yeah. but to summarize all of the work that you've done. <laughs> all of it. 
all of the work that you've Three done words. in this field of relationships. Uh -huh. um, no, but here's your challenge, right? In, in two minutes or less, three principles for a healthy relationship with your partner. If you had to sum it up into three principles in less than two minutes, headline speaking, what would you tell us in all your work? Um, well, first one that leaps out to me is be willing to be influenced by your partner. Be willing to be influenced by your partner. That's number one. Number two, don't ever trust your conclusions about your partner or the relationship or what needs to happen. Don't trust your conclusions. Like be willing to not know how this is supposed to go. Right? Be willing to be in the inquiry. Be willing to get support. You know, get a third party. Work with someone else to help the two of you navigate the gaps and differences between you. Um, so don't trust your conclusions because your conclusions will fuck you over. And um, the third one, I, I suppose I would say is uh, just be willing for it to be messy. You know, be willing for it to be messy and be willing for for. You know, healthy relationship isn't something that you just you find the right person and then you it's it's you have a great relationship. A healthy relationship is something that's cultivated over years. It's an ongoing daily practice um, that requires both people taking 100% responsibility. So let me summarize my summary. What did I say? What was the first one? Do you remember? I don't remember. I, I didn't even write them oh. down. I've just been in, I just been deep, deep dive listening. Well, so then hit the little back 15, 30 seconds of the, the three because just came up with those. But, um, but definitely be willing to get support. You know, be willing to... You know, one of the things like John, your your community of be influenced. By the way, that's what it was. Be influenced. Don't trust uh, don't, your conclusions. Right. Don't trust your conclusions, and let it be messy. Yeah. Let it be messy and be patient. Let it take time. And 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 I'm a huge stand for men working with other men. I think what you're doing in front row dads is vitally important for men coming together and having the conversations we need to have. You know, if you really want to just drill into relationship my elevate your relationship program same it's a community of men all working on our relationships together it's it's a beautiful and profound thing um uh, or just you know my book choose her every day or leave her uh but but man we're, we're all in this shit together it ain't easy for any of us and um i mean john you know you've been married you said 16 years mm -hmm. and y'all just went through another tra transition mm -hmm from from one chapter to to another just at burning man a few months ago mm -hmm. which we talk about on my podcast mm -hmm. so go listen men this way is my podcast to hear my conversation with john there about his experience um but yeah that's what i'd say man thank you brian i appreciate it guys pick up a copy of the book we'll link to all of these goodies in the notes at frontrowdads.com we'll send you to brian's website we'll point you to the book um check out his work Brian's been in it. He's made a big difference to, to men that I know uh, prior to me knowing Brian, which was really cool. It was great yeah. to meet Brian and then have met a man that had already influenced my network massively over the last number of years. Brian, thanks, brother. Appreciate you. Look forward to more. I'll let you go. I know you got a call coming up, but uh, yeah. sending you and your fam lots of love. Thank you, John. Always a pleasure, man. Appreciate the invitation.